welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Well, hello. Welcome to Garden Success. We are looking forward to talking to you today as always. This is a call-in radio show, so I'll do my part by answering questions, but you got to do yours <laughs> by calling in. Oh, boy, with the weather forecast, I think that um, a little bit of the enthusiasm in gardening might be waning, but uh, it is a time that we should be taking care of our plants especially well, and it's still a time when we can do some planting. I realize it's blistering hot coming up this next week, but nevertheless, there are things we can be taken care of. You can certainly bring a container into a semi-sunny area or a shaded porch, plant up some flowers that are good and heat tolerant that are able to, you know, take the the heat of a normal Texas summer. And uh, we'll talk about maybe some flowers and containers and things like that uh, in a minute. But first, I just kind of want to address the elephant in the room and that is, it's going to be 100 degrees for over seven days, or at least right at it. And so what do we do? Well, uh, I think last week, if you're listening, I talked a little bit about the effects of heat on plants. I believe that was last week. Uh, that how when temperatures get not even 100 in the, in the 90s for many plants, uh, some of the metabolic processes start to shut down. Uh, photosynthesis. Uh, what uh, we find in the evening times is uh, there are, the plants go through two things. They go through photosynthesis and they go through respiration, among other things. And uh, they got to be able to do both in order to survive and, and produce, do well. And so when things shut down and you're not able to do one or the other, then there's a problem for the plant. When it's so hot that the plant is pumping as much water as it can to just keep itself cool because they do need to keep themselves cool. I mean, can you imagine if plant surfaces were as hot as the sidewalk when you walk out barefoot on a 98 degree day or 100 degree day? Well, they, they have a way of cooling themselves, but they can't pump water fast enough in many cases. Now, if it's a limited root system, if the soil is dry, uh, if something is injured roots, uh, those all enable or hamper a plant from being able to pump water uh, through its system. We perspire, plants transpire. So uh, why do we perspire? Well, we perspire so that the water, at, among other reasons, are, are, it's a cooling system for us. The water comes out on our skin, the, the perspiration, and uh, then evaporates away and we get evaporative cooling. So that's, that's helpful. Uh, plants have transpiration. They have water vapor that goes out, goes from a liquid form to a vapor form. And in the same process, uh, there is a cooling in the plants, a little air conditioning uh, process, I guess. So what happens when it's so hot? Well, they can't pump water fast enough. I mean, it literally, I mean, it just, in order to keep things going, they need a lot of water, and I guess the plumbing system just can't handle that amount of flow. If the soil is at all dry, then that slows it down too. You know, maybe if it were very mild conditions, it could wait until a little bit of water wicked over back near the root, and it, it's able to take up more and more as it does that. Uh, but it's not those conditions. It's really hot conditions. And so plants are trying to take up moisture. So with dry at all soil conditions they have a problem now we've had rain here in the past two to four weeks we've had some rain uh, our yards are doing pretty good actually so far just because we got a good bank account into the soil with some rain but uh, even uh, with rain sometimes uh, it's not enough for something like a container if you have a container on your patio uh, depending on the size of the container the kind of soil meaning does it hold water well or not does it drain well or not? Uh, and the size of the plant and the type of the plant, it may be that you only need to water every two or three days, and it may be that you need to water twice a day. And so there's a lot of variation there, and you need to watch your plants. If your plants are producing flowers or fruit for you, you especially need to watch your watch your plants because 
when they go through drought stress, they may abort blooms. Uh, they, they may, you know, cease to flower. It takes a lot of carbohydrates to create blooms and to create fruit. And again, here we go with hot temperatures hampering some of the metabolic processes, the ability of the plants to hold water in their leaves. Uh, they like to close the stomates on the bottom of the leaves to save water. They don't want to just send everything they can take up out the leaf right away. And when those when we're dealing with drought conditions, those stomates stay, stay closed, and that water that's, that's part of the process, uh, the metabolic processes in the plant, needs to go out and for, for those things to continue to run. So I guess, you know, there's a lot of um, science reasons that plants struggle in the heat, but we're about to get into the heat. One thing that I, I do want to stress, though, is while plants need lots of water, Lots of water means continually moist roots, continually moist roots, adequately moist roots. It does not mean submerged roots. When roots get submerged and they cannot get oxygen, they are unable to respire. And so th th just think of it this way to um, anthropomorphize or whatever a little bit. Uh, you can't drown the roots. They've got to breathe. And so a good soaking is fine, and but it needs to move out so it's not sitting there waterlogged for days and days on end. And sometimes we're trying to keep our plants happy, and so we're watering and watering and watering. And we may see the plants wilting, which makes us water more. Uh, the wilting could be because of overwatering the roots. When you shut down a root system, when you stress it, when root rots get in, which are some species or some types of root rot fungi are related to excessive soil moisture, uh, then that plant is wilting. So imagine that, a plant sitting in standing water that's wilting. Uh, and so when you add the stress of a 100 degree day to the fact that these root systems are being compromised by overwatering, then you can have death really fast in a plant. And so as we move into the 100 degree temperatures, I would urge you to, you know, dig down in the soil a few inches. That's kind of what I do is I just dig down and feel the soil to see if it needs, you know, it needs any moisture or not. You can tell if it's a little dry to the touch, water it. If it's not, just wait. Uh, and then watch the plants. If you see a little drooping of the leaves, just realize that the drooping can be due to the excessive heat. And your tomatoes, for example, may have adequate soil moisture, but by the mm, 4 o'clock in the day, it was about the hottest time of day, uh, you may see them wilting and then they perk back up that evening. Well, that's just a sign that they couldn't pump water fast enough. That's not a sign that they need to be watered necessarily. Well, that's a lot of nerdy horticulture stuff, but um, I think it's important going into this weather that we think about that. So remember your, your container plants, if they don't have good drainage holes, they need good drainage holes. Uh, and your plants in the garden, think about the soil moisture and make sure they have everything they need but just be ready to deal with the 100 degrees. And sometimes even with adequate moisture, you're going to get uh, some drooping of the plant. By the way, in containers, uh, some containers, this is true of terracotta, for example, and many others, the, the holes are right on the bottom. And if you were to set that on a clay soil and it has good contact with the soil, kind of sealed around the edges, that container won't drain properly because the holes are pressed against clay soil, and clay soil is very slow to take in water. Uh, I mean, incredibly so. You'd be surprised how slow. If you take a typical black clay that we find along the, the Texas Gulf Coast and this upper Gulf Coast area, it's, it's a lot of other places you'll find it out, uh, toward Austin direction and whatnot, that soil can take water in at about an eighth of an inch an hour. Now, that's aside from root channels or earthworm channels or you know other kinds of things but just the soil itself is not able to take water in very fast and so uh, it takes it takes a while to to wet the soil adequately but when you set a pot on that now the drain holes it's as if they've been plugged up it's as if you took modeling clay and shoved it up in the drain holes now how's that pot going to drain that's what's happening so uh, some little stand to put the plant on uh, there's little feet that you can buy to put a, a plant on to hold it up off the off the the ground a little bit. Whatever you want to do, just realize that uh, don't just assume everything's draining. Check things out and make sure that's true. Well, I don't know if I've even given the phone number. Did I do it at the beginning? 
979-845-5689, or if you'd like to email me, gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. And let's go to the phones, and we're going to talk to David. Hello, David. Howdy. Howdy. Um, so I have four garden beds that are raised beds, and oh. one of them is filled with just mint. And so I, it doesn't really serve a purpose at this point, but the mint grew so large that mm-hmm. it's like <clears throat> two or three feet and then it starts falling over. Mm-hmm. And I kept it there because I thought that it would flower and then bring pollinators. But I've seen next to no flowers and just lots of growth. Yeah. Is it because maybe I uh, the fertilizer that I used? No, I don't think so. I'm not a mint expert. I have noticed some mints that flower, and I've noticed other mints that doesn't seem like they get around to it. And I, we have so many types of mint, from spearmint to peppermint to apple mint to, you know, on and on and on. I, I don't know that they all flower as readily as, as another one might. I, my guess is that maybe not. Um, so I don't, if, if you're not getting flowers on it, I don't know that I can tell you something, we'll do this, and now it'll flower. Uh, mint does flower some, but um, yeah, I don't. I can't think of a a way to enhance its flowering if it's healthy. Otherwise, right. Well, I think I'm gonna cut it back down to the ground so it's not so much of a mess. Yes. And then the the new shoots might be a little more tasty for actually yeah. consuming. That's true. Yeah, cutting mint to the ground will not get rid of it, <laughs> to say the least. So you can get all that old mint out of there and. Uh, just have a fresh new bed come out. Right on. Thank you. Yeah, good. Well, that's, that's a good question and, and a good cause. Thank you for the call, David. Uh, our phone number, 979-845-5689. Yeah, uh, beneficial insects, um, it's important to attract them to our, our landscapes. I mean, you can just, you know, you can be in charge of all pest control yourself. There's no, that's A lot of people do it that way. Kind of nuke anything with six legs, and the garden belongs to them. Um, but there are a lot of beneficial insects that do a lot of of um, beneficial things for us in terms of keeping pests at bay. Now, sometimes when you go online, and here we go with social media and stuff like that, uh, you'll see things like put this in your garden, and it'll attract beneficials. And maybe even it goes so far as saying, I, I saw this just the other day, leaf-footed bugs. Uh, we were talking about leaf-footed bugs, I think last week with William, uh, had some on his um, cucurbit crops. And they're the ones that makes a little yellow hard spots in your tomato. So it's how to get rid of leaf-footed bugs. And it was all these things. And one of them was plant flowers to attract beneficial insects. Well, I guarantee you the person that wrote that has no idea which beneficial insect is going to attack a leaf-footed bug. It's primarily going to be something feeding on the eggs or laying eggs. I shouldn't say feeding, laying eggs in its eggs so that the the uh, ho- the uh, host becomes essentially a, a carcass or a body to feed, and feed the uh, uh, beneficial's larva. But that doesn't that kind of thing doesn't work. I mean, you plant a lot of flowers and, and just when you're dealing with leaf-footed bugs, it, you're not going to see adequate control. There will be some, but not adequate control. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to make sure that uh, there is uh, enough of the beneficials around that attack the kinds of pests you have. And the easy one is aphids. There's a lot of things that go after aphids. Little tiny parasitoid wasps, those would be the ones that attack, or that uh, attack, that feed on uh, the nectar of small flowers like the mint David was talking about. Uh, Queen Anne's lace kind of flowers, uh, you know, those little umbrella-like seed heads or, or bloom heads. Uh, and, and many others, small composite flowers, that would be a daisy-shaped flower. Uh, so attracting beneficials is a good thing, and it will help you with your pest control. But be careful about claims that it's a panacea, like if you plant this, you won't have that problem. And a good example is the crepe myrtle aphid. We have those here in town. When you're driving along and you see uh, crepe myrtles that look black, covered with sooty mold, that's most likely the crepe myrtle bark aphid. It could be, uh, there's a different aphid on the leaves. Excuse me, crepe myrtle bark scale. I said that wrong. Crepe myrtle bark scale. There is an aphid that feeds on the leaves. It can also do that. Uh, but uh, the crepe myrtle bark scale has a prime 
natural enemy here, and that is the twice-stabbed lady beetle. What a name. What is it? Well, it's a black lady. Take a lady beetle, spray paint it black, and then put two red dots, one on each side. That would be twice stabbed. And the larvae and the adults uh, feed on scale. But they don't get here fast enough, build up their numbers fast enough to keep scale completely controlled and in check. Now, they're a good thing to have, for sure. But that would just be an example of a truth. Twice stabbed lady beetles and their larvae eat uh, crepe myrtle bark scale applied in a way that is going to not be true. And boy, do we ever get a lot of that in horticulture. Well, let's go back to the phones, 979-845-5689, and we're going to talk to Rick. Hello, Rick. Hello, Skip. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good. Good. I have a question for you. Uh, you know, you talk about plants and everything, and I I have some plants, you know, like roses and things that 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 have small leaves on them, but some are yellow, some are green. Am I overwatering or am I underwatering? Huh, good maybe. Qu- yeah, good question. Uh, sometimes when you go through a dry period, some of the old leaves will turn yellow and fall off. That that can happen. Sometimes the older leaves, well, not sometimes, the older leaves are the ones, if there's a disease on the plant, that has had it the longest. So if you take a rose leaf and it grows and new leaves are growing and new leaves are growing, well, that old leaf has been there a long time. So there's time for fungal leaf spots and things like that to uh-huh. develop and to cause that leaf to be diseased and the, and the plant casts it off. So it could be that as well. Um, you know, there's if, if if the yellowing is kind of a bright yellow, I would say that would be it. If it's just like a lack of green, you know, toward yellow, but maybe chartreuse green, something like that, it could be a nutrient deficiency, but I'll bet that's not a nutrient deficiency. Okay, so so it really isn't like I'm watering too much or not watering enough. It's, it's kind of, because I always wondered, you know, like, how do you, how do you know whether you water too much? On, on there, or you yeah. don't give enough. I mean, if I if I got a little bit of yellow and a little bit of green, like I did on those uh, roses, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's just funny how you know they're they're, they're side by side in the same area. Yeah, so I don't know whether it's you know something like that or so. I have no idea. So, Rick, are you talking about like one plant is yellowing and the and the other plant is green, or on the same plant you have yellow and green? Well, they're both they're both doing about the same thing. Okay, gotcha. You know, and I and I didn't know whether I overwatered or not. You know, it's been hot and everything, and I'm and I'm pretty sure drains okay. I mean, they they've been around for a couple of years, but well, when you know. in, when in <laughs> doubt, just get your hand out, dig down about four inches, and feel the soil. You That's, know? Yeah, and you that, you can kind of tell you know if, I mean if you can squeeze water out of it oh my gosh it's very wet way too wet but even when it's a little sappy you know you can kind of feel that and uh, if it's a little dry to the touch then I would go ahead and give them a good a good watering. Okay, because I I just you know I, I just looked weird you know to yeah to see a little bit of I mean it has some small petals on it mm-hmm. and I don't, I don't really know what kind they are I don't remember <laughs> what they okay. were when I planted them but uh, but they're doing all right it's just. Yeah, you know, you get a little bit of both, and you're going. Well, that, you know, is that? I mean, I mean, like if, if I had a regular plant, thin plant, and I was watering it, what would tell me that I overwatered it? You know, would it be it, wilting? Would it? Be, it, could, it could be drooping, but it's more likely going to be starting to to die back uh, because roots are dying, and therefore the top. If you don't have a root, you can't take up water either, even though it's in standing water. If the roots uh-huh. rotted, it can't take up water. Uh, uh, something on some a lot of plants, and this is true, especially pretty much everyone I think has a pothos ivy in the house. <laughs> this is the most common house plant. Yeah. Uh, but when I let my pothos get a little dry, and then I water them, they perk up. Uh, right after that, uh, some old leaves will turn yellow, and they okay. just, I mean r- yellow, yellow, the whole leaf, and I just pull them off. Uh, but I notice any time I let that fluctuation occur from eh, it's too much drought to a good soaking, I see that transition. So that can happen on plants too. Okay, because I, I, you know, because I just thought maybe I'm killing it, you know, or something. Else. Well, <laughs> you know, but then, but am I or am I not? You know, it, it, <laughs> that, you know. That, well, that you may be. <laughs> I mean, I, sometimes we kill our plants, and I can't eliminate all things. Uh, but uh, in general, what you're describing doesn't alarm me. But you know, uh, yeah. if you if you wish, you could always email a photo or two to okay. gar- garden success at tamu dot edu. And when I see a picture, sometimes what I've pictured in this conversation, the uh-huh. photo the photo isn't what my mind's eye was seeing. And so 
that that would be helpful. Maybe I could take it a step farther for you. Yeah, that'd probably be a lot easier for you because, you know, it just seemed weird because I've always thought, well, you could overwater it or underwater it, but but how do you know, you know, if if you really gave it too much water because, yeah. I, you know, in the springtime we got a lot of rain. Yeah, that's true. And, 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 and you know, and I thought, well, I'm watering them, but, you know, is it too much? I mean, how do you, yeah. you know, these are, these are not in pots or anything. They're in the ground and... And, uh, and so well, I just never thought about putting my finger in the ground. I just thought pots and stuff would right. be the ones I'd watch. Right. Well, God gave us a bunch of water measuring devices on the ends of our hands. So yep. I would yep. use those to get down there and, <laughs> and measure the water. That's about and, the and best you know, you I were, can tell you. And, and, you. and, you know, you were talking about how hot it is, you know. And, and I usually do most of my stuff early morning or, or in the early evening or something when it's a little cooler, you know. But mosquitoes will kill you. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you've been around, but the mosquitoes yes. are around, you know. I know. It's, it's funny how, you know, for, for most of us that we'd like to to do gardening stuff, you yeah. know, that, uh, you know, and, and, I, and I like to do a lot of uh, of uh, rainwater harvesting and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I get a lot of that because I like to water them with the rainwater. Right. Yeah. You know? But, you know, then you have to watch, you know, to make sure that no mosquitoes get into it or, yeah. or whatever, keep it all down. And That's and a good, I, good point. And what I did, and I, I don't know if it's right or wrong or anything, but I'll take a little bit of, you know, like a little bit of like corn oil or something or cooking mm-hmm. oil, put a few drops in there, and it, what it does is put a little sheen on it. Yeah. It, but, but well, it, that that is one way people have controlled them, uh, an oil on the surface. I've got some better ways, though, and I'm going right. to I'm gonna go to another right. call, but when I come back right. after that, I will talk about mosquitoes a little bit and elaborate right. on that. Okay? Thanks, Skip. I really appreciate it, buddy. Thank you, sir. Good to hear your voice. Good to hear you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Our phone number is 845-5689, and now we're going to talk to Mike. Hello, Mike. Hey, Skip. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks. Good, good. Uh, I We lost a lot of uh, San Augustine and Bermuda in our uh, yard last summer when we had the drought, and so uh, I called earlier in the year, and I replaced that with something that you I couldn't figure out what it was, and you said it's probably some kind of rye. Well, it was rye on steroids for sure, mm. and and it died out. But it died out when it got hot, so well, it was some kind of rye. Yeah, that's that's the case. Rye, there's a number of grasses like that. I had some uh, something called rescue grass that was coming up in a part of the yard I wasn't really taking care of, and and mm-hmm. boy, when it died out, I could see where my Saint Augustine was for sure. <laughs> well, uh, the, what's replaced the rye now is that we've got two weeds in our yard. One is goose grass, which fortunately we don't have a whole lot of that. But there's another kind of weed, and I sent pictures to your website. I don't know if you got them or I'm not. I'm looking at them right now, Mike. Yeah, and I don't know exactly what they are, but we have a lot of it in the yard, and it's well-rooted, and it's hard to get up. And I'm trying to get it up and remove it and allow the, the Bermuda and a little bit of the San Augustine to come back without damaging that. And I wonder if there's a, a easy way to apply something on it rather than just digging mm-hmm. it up. Yeah, killing the grass in the grass is is a tough thing. Um, I would, uh, when I look at these pictures, it looks to me just like one of the, there's a couple types of crabgrass that are pretty common around here, and it looks mm-hmm. like a type of crabgrass. And so let me, let me just check. I'm going to look and see. But I think that's what you're dealing with. But, yeah, pulling it up is one thing, but this weed comes up high above the, above the St. Augustine, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah. so, so when you when you have a weed like that, you have the option of using a um, kills all type uh, weed killer. I mean, it could be something like glyphosate, which is Roundup's one of the commonly known brands. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it could be one of those kind of things, or it could be a grass only killer. Uh, there's two different ingredients that are sold in various products, one or the other, as a grass killer. And so it may be you would use one of those. That's kind of like three different chemical options that you would have. And if you put it in a wiper type applicator, you kind of mm-hmm. can go over your grass and rub it on the weed without getting it on your grass. If you're careful, you don't want to soak it right. until it's dripping. But that that would be another option. Uh, I might consider that. Um, okay. Uh, that if anytime you want to get a weed where you can avoid 
Uh, well, you have to avoid a good plant nearby. Those wipers are really good. I, I make, okay. I have some that I make homemade just from those things you use to grab a, a jar off a shelf, those little sticks with a with a grip on mm -hmm. them. You squeeze them and it grabs the jar at the end of the stick. Well, sure, you sure. can you can put sponges. You just have to engineer it, uh, figure out how okay. to engineer that. You can put sponges on the end of that. You need a little plate behind them so that it right. kind of holds them. Right. I use those metal plates that are with holes in them that are used to connect to two by fours from the box stores. Okay. You know what I'm talking about? Well, I, I, that's uh, that would probably work if you just have a kind of a thick patch, and that's yeah, mostly just, what you have. In just here, here yeah. and there, yeah, just when you have but it. But if and you, there. but if you have what we have is just little patches, and patches are kind of growing up on their own. But a lot of it's grown up in the in the San Augustine or in the uh, Bermuda, yeah. which is doing pretty well. And I don't want to. I'm trying to I'm trying to baby that along this year. <laughs> yeah, there there actually is another option. I I generally don't recommend it because unless you just have a little area, it's kind of cost prohibitive. But there's a product I can't remember the name. Of it. It's made with cinnamon, basically a cinnamon powder, hmm. and you sprinkle hmm. it out there. And I mean, it burns crabgrass really well and doesn't burn okay. your Saint Augustine. Uh, hmm. But I mean, you'll see it really quick on a warm day. Uh, in fact, I'd almost be a little afraid of it on a 100-degree day, you know. But anyway, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that'll work. But, you know, if you're trying to treat a large area, that's going to get pricey. Yeah, okay. Well, that, that gives me some ideas, and uh, I'll work on that. And I, I just didn't want to put anything on it that would kill the grass that I've got kind of started pretty good in certain areas. Yeah. So I wanted to be careful about that. Yeah, and crabgrass, it, you know, it some weeds can set their blooms down in the turf. And so, you, mm -hmm. like a grass burr, you can mow the tops of grass burrs off and you'll get seed heads down lower that you don't mm -hmm. get. But the crabgrass, not so much. So if you wanted to use a bagger and mow over it and get those tops with any seed heads that might be thinking about forming, uh, I think mm -hmm. you, you probably could kind of uh, at least prevent it from getting worse. And okay. then next okay. year, when we hit about mid-February, uh, a pre-emergent that does well against grasses, uh, grassy weed seeds, mm -hmm. you might want to get that down uh, if your lawn is still thin enough to have the crabgrass problem. Uh, in right. the meantime, I would work on the mow, water, fertilize, and those three all together done right can get that density up to where crabgrass doesn't get enough light to germinate. Okay. Well, I'll try that then. I appreciate your comments. All Thanks right, so sir. Much. Thank you. Appreciate the call. Right. Our, fo our phone number is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email, gardensuccess at tamu. Dot edu. Well, I want to wish a happy birthday to the gardens. I think we are, uh, well, I think we're at uh, five or seven, five years old. Yeah. Uh, the gardens on campus, if you haven't been out there, you, gosh, you need to go. I mean, it, it, it is always beautiful and changing. Uh, you know, you want to see the spring flowers, summer flowers, fall flowers, even in the winter time. It's beautiful out there. And uh, on weekends, I guess, uh, barring some other sporting event that takes over parking lots, uh, there is a way that you can park for free on the weekends and walk over and see the gardens. You just have to go to the gardens website. It's the gardens uh, on, at tamu dot, at, on campus. Just do a search and find it. I don't have their website in my head right now. Uh, but it's really beautiful out there. And they're they're having their fifth anniversary. And, boy, they have plans for lots of new developments. Uh, it, it's going to really be a beautiful place more and more and more with each addition that they put in out there. But it is well worth visiting right now. Lots of really cool stuff. Lots of cool stuff. Gardens on campus. I always love to go visit there. I where I get a lot of my good photos because it's always so beautiful out there. Uh, let's see. We're going to go to the phones and talk to Tom. Hello, Tom. How are you today? We got Tom there. Oh, excuse me, Dan. There we go. Hello, Dan. Oh. Hi, Skip. I'm uh, taking the I'm taking the wrong call and out of order. So, <laughs> how can I how can I help? I had a couple questions. Uh, if you don't have time, that's fine. Uh, my first question is about compost and two different types. Okay. Uh, so I went, to, I went to a soil yard here in town, and they sell uh, a variety of types of soils. And uh, one they recommend for growing vegetables in is based on mushroom compost. Okay. 
are the salt levels in the mushroom compost bad for us since we already are high in salt? Yes, but the, they can be washed out. Uh, you can, with a, a good, thorough drenching, uh, you can wash the, sal the, the uh, salts out of it. Uh, and so I wouldn't, I have used it before uh, and not had a salt problem uh, with it. And it's only going to be used in moderation anyway. Uh, so it is a little higher on pH, so you just kind of want to watch for that. But it, it is a rich type of compost. Sometimes it stinks, though. <laughs> I don't know if you've smelled it or not. But yep. until it until it kind of mellows, it's it's a, got it, an odor to it. Uh, but it's very rich, and uh, you can grow good gardens. And in fact, I've got some beds that have some of that in them right now. Yeah, I, have, I have a pile of it about 10 feet away from me, and it stinks for sure. <laughs> yeah, that, that's it. Uh, but yeah, once you also. once you get it out there and mix it in and water it, that that'll mellow. You know, there's a lot of microbial activity that goes on, and and it takes care of that. And um, they did not recommend uh, compost, which is based on biosolids. Um, so I have gotten it from the local uh, place here. Is is that not good to grow vegetables in? Um, I mean, they gave me the test report that said it had no heavy metals and, you know, it checks out good. Uh, so, yet, so, so the so the compost you bought is made with biosolids? Uh, no, I've, I've been out to the facility and purchased uh, some, some trailers full of biosolid compost. Um, did I just poison myself? No, by growing vegetables no. In there? no, I generally say don't use it in a vegetable garden just because uh, yeah, over the years it used to be a big heavy metal problem. And so we avoided it for that. People used it on lawns and stuff. There's, there's actually a fertilizer made from that kind of stuff, not compost, but just the sewage effluent. Um, and it's used on golf courses and lawns a lot. But I would... I, I would avoid it, but if you've already done it, uh, you're not going to die from it. Uh, they, they they do go through something to make sure that the the microbial issues aren't there. People that want to go, you know, all the way organic sometimes have questions and issues about it, and those are questions I can't answer. Like, well, you know, if something gets flushed down the toilets of Bryan College Station, is it going to be in that compost? And I. I'm pretty comfortable with the fact that the composting process will take care of most things, uh, but personally, I would I would avoid it on a vegetable garden just out of caution, not because I know there's a problem. So I don't want to I don't want to cast shade on it uh, specifically because I I don't know that. Okay. Yeah, because if you ask them, they'll give you the test reports and. And is that I mean, look is that a microbial look or is that a, a chemical or nutrient look or what? All the above, I believe. Oh, okay. uh, I'm not. I'm not an expert in reading those reports, well, but the guy went through it with me and said, "Yeah, everything's good. Doesn't have metals. Doesn't have." Okay. So I I was convinced that it was okay. Well, but, and, and <laughs> you know what you just said. If that's the case, then I you know wouldn't be as concerned about it. But I can tell you this: that you know organic purists are going to have an issue with that, especially. Um, and so, yeah, I like I said, if it's already in your garden, just just go go garden. Um, do you have time for another question? Sure. Um, to reset an overgrown chase tree. Okay. Because uh, when, you, when you're driving around and you see the nice circular ones with all the purple spikes, um, if you have one that is wildly out of control, mm -hmm. uh, way high, uh, can you just, in the wintertime, just shear it way back and kind of start over? Or yes. do you think you'll kill it? You will not kill it. Um, it, you'll have a lot of suckers. <laughs> and so I might, uh, oh boy, you don't want to prune it too late in the season because you don't want tender new growth going into an early freeze or something like that. Uh, but you can do a little trimming here and there. I, I need to get out and trim all the seed heads off of mine. Mine isn't as big as yours. I can reach them all uh, and trim those off so it comes out with fresh new growth and more blooms. Entering this 100 degrees for a week, you know, I kind of, I think I'm going to hold off on any serious pruning of it. But you can even do some trimming during the season. But in the wintertime, if you want to cut way back, you can. Uh, it, If you want it to be a bush, then cutting it way back, it's going to be a, a bush for sure. Uh, if you would like to select a few limbs to be maybe a mul like most crepe myrtles, multi-stemmed, uh, multi-trunked, 
Uh, if you want it to be like that, you can trim it according to that. You're going to get sprouts all along the stems coming out, and so you just kind of have to train it as you wish. Uh, I have mine kind of growing with, I don't know, two or three trunk, three trunks coming out of the ground, and then at certain places I've left them to fork and form two branches, and then those two will, will split and form two more. Uh, you don't need to overthink it. It's just whatever you want it to look like. But the basic answer to your question is you can run over it with a brush hog and it'll be back. Oh, okay. They're tough as nails. Uh, may I ask one more? Sure. I go? Sure. I, think. Okay. I could talk to you all day. I'm okay. Um, if you're growing vegetables in containers, like three, five, seven, fifteen 15 gallons, I've seen some literature that says it's not worth uh, mixing soil uh, that has a bunch of compost in it because it's not going to be the, the primary thing it needs is fertilizer, not all the, the life in the soil. Would you agree with that? Or should I make a nice rich soil recipe with uh, compost and various other things in there? Well, I would, I would use a, 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 if it's a very large container, something like a bed mix type mix in it or a compost mix, you can do that. It's just as you get a whole lot of, let's say you use pure potting soil, that's going to get, it's going to sink down and get kind of mucky and soggy, especially toward the bottom, because it's not chunky. Uh, you know what I'm saying? And so yeah. if, if it's a small container, just, you know, 100% potting soil is fine. But you just want it to drain well, but you want it to hold water. Uh, sometimes I, uh, if a, a, I want a little more weight in it, I may use some sand in with the the composted materials just to provide a little more weight because when that when potting soil dries out it gets extremely light when it's wet it's it's got weight to it and so if you get it dries out a little bit and the wind blows and you have a tall plant well it's going to knock your containers over so those are all little minor factors but I generally avoid any kind of a regular soil uh, although a little bit uh, in a large container of a quality topsoil not what usually is sold as topsoil uh, a quality topsoil would be fine, but you're going to provide the nutrients you need, and and the microbial activity is it's fine. I mean it it enhances root growth in many different ways, and that that would be a subject of a whole show really uh, to just scratch the surface of that. But uh, I I don't know if I've answered your question or not, but that I think I did. I, I think you did too. Um, <laughs> is there any way to is there any microbial process or other process which will take the bottom part of the large containers, which have now turned into like mud clay, mm -hmm. and get that back into shape? Or do I just have to dump it out and remix it? I, I reuse mine. And if I ever had a plant die of a root rot or ne have nematodes or something come in with a plant and now they're in the potting soil, I wouldn't reuse it. But otherwise, I'll mix it up with some fresh soil, mix it, blend it up. Uh, that is just a, a very nice little humus material that, uh, you know, can enhance. I wouldn't I wouldn't use, you know, like 75% of it in a mix for sure, but maybe 25 would be fine. Okay. Well, I've, I've done it very wrong, so I'll, I'll give you some pictures of the results at some point. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you for the call, Dan. I appreciate that, and good luck. Right. Bye-bye. Right. Let's go to the phones now and talk to Tom. By the way, our number is 845-5689. Hello, Tom. Thanks for hanging on. Hey, Skip. That's no problem. I, we've got a couple live oak trees. And we're trying to keep the grass from going up around in there so we don't have to trim close. Okay. Uh, I've tried mulch, but the grass typically comes up through the mulch. Is there a better choice? Uh, this is starting to sound like Bermuda grass. Uh, do you yes. Know? Okay. So, and these live oaks, they're, I'm, I'm gathering they're small trees if you're worried about weed eating around. Oh, uh, they're about 10, 12 foot high, and they're about three years old. Okay. I would give them as big a bed as you can tolerate looking at. If you ask the live oak, it would say, I don't want to see grass. I don't even want to see it down the street. <laughs> uh, but, you know, because it, it's competitive, it takes water, it takes nutrients, and it brings the lawnmower and weed eater close, as you said. Uh, so I would use a grass-only killer. These are products that kill grassy plants. They don't kill broadleaf weeds. And so they're used in flower beds because uh, you can spray them over most flowers uh, and shrubs and uh, kill the grass, but not the plant that you got that product on. Of course, we don't want to intentionally just 
blast a plant with it, but they work pretty well. Uh, one of them, uh, there's two types, and one of them has sethoxidem in it, so look for the ingredient starting with S-E-T-H. The other one has fluazophobe in it, and look for F-L-U-A-Z. Uh, either one of those will kill grass and not kill your broadleaf weeds, and they're available in the home garden market. Okay. But get that, get that mulch as wide as you aesthetically can take it. Uh, the tree would like it out to the edges of its branches, especially a young tree like that, maybe even further. Uh, but a good mulched area. Then when the grass starts to come in, you could just do a little squirt here and there and, and take it out. You're not having to patrol the whole area once you've killed it out of the center. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Good luck with that. Let's see. Our phone number, 979-845-5689. Nine seven nine eight four five five six eight nine. A while ago, I was visiting with uh, Rick about uh, mosquitoes. We our conversation moved into mosquitoes, and mosquitoes are a problem uh, here when it rains. Uh, you know, mosquitoes. It's just a few days. Uh, they can lay eggs in a few days. They hatch, and a few more days, and maybe a week. I don't know. Depends on the species of mosquito. Uh, now you got mosquitoes flying around. They've gone through the larval stage, and here. Here they are, making our outdoors not very enjoyable. It's as if it wasn't already enough having fire ants and 100-degree heat. Now we're going to throw some mosquitoes into the picture. I think the best, the two things, I would say the mosquito control, is, there's two steps. Number one, patrol your property, and hopefully your neighbors would too, and find any source of standing water and get rid of it. So it could be a bird bath. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, it could be a saggy gutter on your house. Those hold, all it takes is just, you know, half inch of water, probably less, in, in a small area. And if the water is still and it, if, if it has rotting organic matter in it, that's even better. Um, and mosquitoes are going to breed in it. So look around. Uh, I was out of my landscape the other day, and I had a bag of potting soil outside that I had been using, and then I just left it out on the patio and kind of twisted it and pushed it down. And there was standing water in the plastic of the potting soil from a previous rain, and I had just not even thought about that. Well, here I had a, a mosquito breeding area in that small area. So find any standing water and get rid of it. Now, with things that you want water in, like a bird bath, or maybe you have a little pond, uh, if you can cause a ripple in the water, and there are actually devices of that. There's a little floating fountain that you can put in, in water, and it, it sprays up and comes down. It's a little, just think of a little raft going through your, your pond. Uh, there's another device that just uh, wiggles the water and creates a ripple of waves constantly going out. Uh, and mosquitoes don't like that moving water. They want stagnant, still water. The other thing that I think is really good is there's a product, and there's two forms of it. It's called Mosquito Dunks when it's sold as little donuts. They're about the size of little Debbie's Donuts, if you know what that is. Uh, little Debbie's Donuts. And you throw them in pond, and it takes them about a month to dissolve, and they release a natural disease of mosquitoes. But it's a disease of mosquitoes only if a lady beetle stops there to get a drink of water or a parasitoid wasp that you want to keep or if your pet drinks out of it um, you get the idea it, they're they're 100 percent organic in fact they're certified organic and i'm 90 I'm percent sure that's yeah i'm pretty sure that's true anyway they're they're an organic product it's an organic compound that's a form of bt a different form than we use for caterpillars and it works really well. If you just have something and you want to real quick knock the mosquito larva out of it, you can put the granule form. There is also a granule form. It's kind of like grape nuts. Here I go with all these food analogies. Uh, but it's about just, if you know what grape nuts are, uh, it's just little chunks. And you sprinkle it out. And that does a faster job because you can sprinkle it, the little granules, over a larger area. And they're releasing that beet, it's a form of BT, B BT Israeliensis, I believe it's BT Israel, yeah, Israeliensis, uh, and it it works really well. Uh, so if you needed a, maybe had a little swampy area and you you got larva already in it, well, use a granular form and it knocks it out faster. The the donuts, the, the dunks or donuts, they take a while to disintegrate. And so they give you longer control over the area. 
but each one I think covers about 100 square feet, so like 10 by 10 per donut. It's probably more than you want to know about mosquito control. But we need to be doing it. Uh, I was out in the garden uh, early this morning and the mosquitoes were out and they were there to help me garden. Uh, I just wear long sleeves. I even have a thing I put around my neck. You know how they go in the back of your neck and uh, I wear a hat and some, something around my neck just so they cannot find uh, any skin to get to and that, that works pretty well. And then of course there's the repellents we put on uh, to keep them off of us. Our phone number, if you'd like to give us a call, is 979-845-5689, 845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at tamu dot edu, gardensuccess at tamu dot edu. I'd go here, I'm going to look at some pictures. I had a question uh, come in from Linda uh, about some kukuzi squash. How many of you out there grow kukuzi squash? Uh, if you, um, if you, if your family heritage is Italian, I bet you have heard of kukuzi squash. That's very popular. It's not the only culture that eats kukuzi squash, but um, that's really popular. Some of you may be going, "What is a kukuzi squash?" Well, if you walked up and looked at it, you'd probably think, "Well, that's that's got to be a a gourd or something like that," and it looks a lot like kind of a gourd, long and skinny. Linda, the photos you sent are from an Apple phone. They're the, they end in .heic, and I cannot open that on a PC computer. So I don't know. I, I know that the question is, um, some of the leaves are curling, and you don't see any bugs and things. If it's new tender tissue curling, it's it could be some kind of bug with piercing, sucking mouth parts that's uh, feeding on the plant, causing a deformation in the leaf. Uh, if it's if if the, it's more of like you're rolling it up, then I would open those curled up leaves, those rolled leaves, and you're probably going to find a caterpillar inside that has stitched them together to to go in from a caterpillar to the pupal stage. Uh, but if you can get some better pictures to me, I can be more specific with a with an answer. I know that's that's a little bit of a pain to have to try to get out there and get pictures and get them converted and everything. But uh, let's see. I want to go back to email again. And last week, Elizabeth uh, sent some pictures of Turk's cap, and the leaves were eaten. Uh, a little bit of sections missing in between the veins. And since then, I've gotten several pictures at the AgriLife Extension office uh, of completely skeletonized leaves of hibiscus. And by skeletonized, I mean it looks like lace. So if you take a leaf and you were able to put it in like an acid that ate away all the spongy soft parts of the leaf and just left the veins, then that's skeletonized. It looks like lace. And, and that is a soft fly. It is a hibiscus sawfly, and I think that's what you're seeing on your Turk's cap. They're very closely related. Uh, interestingly enough, the sawfly, even though it likes the, the mallow family, uh, you don't see it on cotton. You don't see it on okra. Oh, what's another big mallow plant? I'm forgetting something important. Anyway, uh, you don't see it on those, but on hibiscus, the southern hibiscus, not the uh, tropical types that have all the big, bright, multicolored blooms, uh, but the kind that have red, white, and or yellow blooms, uh, or, or, or white blooms, uh, the dinner plate size, it gets on those about a lot. And th because it's a saw fly, now you look at it, you turn the leaf over, and you see these little boogers eating, and you think, okay, here comes the BT. Well, it won't work. BT kills caterpillars. It kills moth and butterfly larvae. Saw flies are fly larva. It's actually a type of fly. And so you need something different. And I would use, uh, if you want to go on the uh, softer end or, or more organic end, you, you can use something that has spinosad in it. Spinosad. Uh, and there are many products that have spinosad. Or you could use any other kind of a general purpose insecticide. I like to go a little specific when I can, just so that I don't kill more than the insect I'm after. So spinosad is good for leaf feeding pests. You might have success on that. Let me think about this. Yeah. I. Well, another option would be to spray uh, the Aza Direct in form of neem on the leaf. Both spinosad and neem will soak into the leaf, and they're good for leaf feeding pests. I, I've not tried it for soft flies, the neem, but I, I bet it would work also. 
Yeah, that, that can be a problem. And, and why do they create that lace? Well, I've seen this on many different kinds of plants, but when caterpillars hatch out, their little egg is tiny. And, you know, it's, it, the caterpillar that hatches out is super tiny. Well, that little caterpillar has a tiny set of jaws, and so it can eat the spongy mesophyll material off the top of the leaf and when it and the bottom and when they feed like that they leave a very fine very dense network of the smaller veins as well then they molt and get a bigger set of leaves and now they can eat even some of the small veins and so you get more of a lacy look and then they molt and get a bigger set of leaves and now all that's left is you know the largest veins on the leaf and so but just by looking at the damage from a distance you can tell what kind of caterpillar or in this case, soft lamma dealing with, uh, and, and how far along is it? And remember that they have a lot of enemies. There's wasps that haul them off to their nest, uh, the paper wasp under your eaves. Their number one food source is caterpillars in general. So they're out there patrolling the gardens and helping you. You may have had a little outbreak of some caterpillars and next thing you know they're gone well there's a number of different beneficials that can do that so just because you see damage doesn't mean you have an active infestation so turn a few leaves over if if they are if it's a caterpillar or a soft fly they'll still be around uh, unless it's one that goes down and hides in the soil and comes back out of the soil but i i doubt that's going to be uh, the case that you see you're listening to garden success if you would like to give us a call our phone number is 845 845- Five six eight nine eight four five fifty six eighty nine, or by email, you can reach me at garden success at or at tamu.edu. Garden success at tamu.edu. And Chris emails uh, with a picture of some junipers that are dying. Uh, one's alive, one's dying. And what causes this? Well, a lot of things can affect junipers. Uh, Our eastern red cedar even has some problems that can occur, but not nearly as much as some of the junipers that we like to plant in our landscape. The things called Italian cypress, those those are a good example. Uh, We have bagworms that feed on the foliage. We have uh, foliage diseases, blights, uh, especially during rainy weather that can affect the foliage. Uh, And then we just have overall collapse of the system. And you know, it's it's hard to answer those kind of questions. I, in fact, I dread my trees dying questions because the answer is never simple, uh, like it was with saw flies. Um, it, because it, it, you have like, let's say you have three plants all together and one turns completely brown, according to the caller or emailer overnight, uh, and the others look fine. And so you say, well, you know, maybe it was soil moisture, too much, not enough, or whatever. And they go, well, all plants are together. Well, the plants are genetically different. That's one thing. You can't assume that the soil is identical, you know, everywhere underneath the ground. And and so there's just a lot of variables. But if you think of it like this tree is being stressed, all the trees are being stressed, but they're hanging on. And if it goes a little too far, maybe one of them, it just goes downhill and you lose it. And the others are stressed, but they're not to that point yet. And so that is the best that I can do in terms of selling you why this happens. Uh, but when a juniper turns brown, it will never re-sprout. In fact, if you go out to a juniper or an eastern red cedar and you cut off only the little green scale-like needles that they have. You just remove all of that and there's no, there's just a bunch of branches with, you know, little small finger size branches coming off of them. It will never re-sprout, which any other tree we can think of would, would re-sprout. But these, these can't. Pine trees are the same thing. You cut back to behind the last living needle, that branch is dead, it will never re-sprout. And so once the uh, bagworms or foliage diseases or this kind of drought browns them out, they're not going to come back. They're just not. And uh, unfortunately, about all that's left with a plant like that is a future of being a fence post uh, because there, there's not a, not a good, uh, good solution to it. Uh, Long term, uh, Chris, I would consider uh, the soil moisture if it's too dry occasionally, not often, every maybe two weeks in an extended drought, a good soaking of the soil, a good deep soaking, wet the soil a foot deep, and and then leave it alone, let it dry out again. 
that can be kind of a rescue treatment for, for plants. Uh, if it's too wet, uh, it's kind of hard to fix that other than something like a French drain takes water away and helps the soil not stay soggy waterlogged. Uh, but that is just a problem that we have to deal with and, and it's disappointing and discouraging because some of the most beautiful plants we have uh, are, are plants that are you know going to succumb to problems like that. Uh, Jenna sends a picture of a 19-year-old live oak tree uh, that has sprouts coming out and they're they're been going on over and over and they keep trimming them back and they keep coming back. Uh, there there are there's I'm going to give two answers to that Janice. One, uh, there are different strains of live oak. There is a strain along the Gulf Coast that tends not to sucker as much. Uh, Quercus virginiana all through from here to Virginia. I don't know how far live oaks go in their natural range. And then there's a kind we have. We see it a lot in the in the hill country. If you're driving through the hill country, and I've seen it even down, you know, down toward Quero direction, Victoria in that area, where you where you may have a strain that um, forms mots. So you'll you'll see. A, a group of tree trunks all close together out in the pasture and then over later another group of tree trunks. Mott farming type, types tend to send up more of the suckers as well but the main cause is when we water a lot around the base and do anything that disturbs the soil like if you were to rototill around a live oak uh, and, and try to put in a bed everywhere you nicked a root you're going to have suckers coming up. It just kind of how it ends up. So every time you cut them, they just, there's buds on them at the base. You can cut below the buds and they just re-sprout and come back. And that's a pain. That's a problem. There might be one time where I would say that you would want to use a, a root barrier type cloth. Uh, a root barrier type cloth uh, can help keep those down by completely shading them out, but you need something with weight on top of it. Uh, and that's about the best, I believe, uh, that you're going to be able to do. I see there's some other folks out there that have emailed, and I'm going to hold those, if you will, until uh, next time we come back, uh, next Thursday. Uh, you're listening to Garden Success, and we're here every Thursday from 12 to 1. Uh, I invite you to listen. I invite you also to listen uh, to the podcasts. If you're if you have a podcast um, uh, app that you like, uh, check for Garden Success with Skip Richter. I think you may find it on there, and you can listen to past shows as well as on the KAMU FM website. You've been listening to Garden Success with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.